Rob Bryanton, and welcome back to the Imagining the Tenth Dimension video blog. Today's video blog is called Unlikely Events and Timelessness. It's dated August 2nd, 2008, and you can find it and read along with it if you go to tenthdimension.com slash blog. Now today we're talking about randomness, unlikely events, and uh, one of the quantum physics ideas that uh, the wave function of a person includes the possibility of them popping out of existence in one place and uh, suddenly reappearing on the moon. So uh, we're trying to uh, portray some of those ideas with the, uh, the uh, video designs that we're coming up with for these. Jason is uh, uh, over here. Jason has uh, come up with a kind of a fascinating look for this one. And uh, just every now and again, he's just going to pop me into a different place to uh, show that uh, that really is part of the possibility set for, uh, for our universe and for people within that universe. The video blog goes like this. One of the stumbling blocks for mainstream science's willingness to embrace my way of visualizing how our reality is constructed is rooted in the difficulty in adopting a truly timeless perspective. In chapter 3 of my book, I said this. As we've been careful to note, our concept of time being a full spatial dimension is often not the accepted notion within the world of physics. Interestingly, science has a bit of a split personality when it comes to discussions of time. So, while Einstein's theories and the theories that follow from his concepts seem to indicate that space-time is a tangible fabric which can be bent and stretched, there are many other examples where science treats time as being a completely separate entity. In other words, time becomes a quality which gets overlaid on top of the other spatial dimensions, rather than just being another dimension which is woven together with the ones above and below. In the Wikipedia article in Time, we find this famous quote, Time is nature's way of keeping everything from happening at once. According to Wikipedia, this quote has been attributed variously to John Archibald Wheeler, Woody, Island, er, Woody Allen, and Albert Einstein. Einstein has many quotes that express similar concepts. For instance, the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. What are we talking about here? Timelessness. Because that timeless perspective that some of the best minds of the past century have encouraged us to adopt is essential to understanding how this project portrays the underlying structures of reality. Now there's a video blog entry called Space Time Tree. If you uh, search for those words uh, in Google or on YouTube or at Rever or Metacafe or lots of the other uh, video uh, sites that we've been posting these video blogs at, uh, that's one that I'd like you to watch. In blog entries like Space Time Tree, we've talked about ways of visualizing that timeless perspective. In entries like The Fifth Dimension Isn't Magic and the annotated Tenth Dimension video, we quoted experts like Brian Greene and Michu Kaku, who talk about the strange quantum physics facts that seem unexplainable from our limited fourth dimensional perspective. How could entangled particles instantaneously affect each other, effectively at faster than speed of light, even across huge distances? How can the wave function of a person include the highly unlikely possibility that they pop out of existence here and reappear on the moon? For me, these are examples of the strong indications that the timeless perspective has to allow for higher dimensional connections. Just like imagining a flat lander on a Mobius strip twisting and turning in the dimension above, our fourth dimensional line has connections, twists and turns that occur in the fifth dimension. We remain unaware of those twists and turns as we travel down our fourth dimensional line. Entanglement violates no laws of physics if it occurs as a result of fifth dimensional connections, and a wave function that allows for unlikely possibilities is much easier to visualize if we place those so unlikely they would take longer than the life of the universe to occur possibilities in the sixth dimension. Now, New Scientist magazine named the David Deutsch team at Oxford's proof that parallel universes exist one of the greatest news stories of 2007. Everett's Many Worlds interpretation is closely tied to this proof. Despite last year's proof, there are still many scientists who reject any Many Worlds type of portrayal as being too extravagant. This interpretation means that with every branching choice or random outcome, another copy of our universe is created. How can there possibly be room for all those universes? There certainly doesn't seem to be room for them here in the fourth dimension, which already contains the unimaginably huge vista of 70 sextillion stars that we call our observable universe of space-time. 
the intuitive leap I'm arguing for here is that trying to keep the wave function of a branching set of parallel universes that occur at both the quantum and macro level in a logical hierarchy becomes much simpler if we use a model that moves those branching possibilities into the fifth dimension, which is where Kaluza approved and Einstein eventually agreed our reality is defined. But doing so requires us to accept that time really is one of the two possible directions in the fourth spatial dimension, an idea also advanced by Sean Carroll in the June issue of Scientific American. Now, in editor John Rennie's introduction to that issue, he talks about popular literature's various explorations of the fourth dimension. He mentions Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five, a wonderful book I've read and enjoyed several times, which includes as a plot element a science fiction race of aliens from the planet Trollfamador. The Trollfamadorians, as it turns out, really do have the timeless perspective we're talking about here, and they view the past, present, and future much as you and I would view a mountain range spreading out across the horizon. Now, why bring up science fiction as an introduction to an article by a serious physicist about the nature of time? Because that perspective of timelessness that Vonnegut attributed to his Trollfalmadorians really is necessary to understanding the underlying nature of reality. Now, in uh, the previous blog to this one, we talked about randomness and the missing 96% of our universe. In his Scientific American article, Sean Carroll also talks about randomness and the likelihood of events to occur. I'm going to quote from that article now. He says, Imagine that you pour milk into your coffee. There are a great many ways to distribute the molecules that the milk and coffee are, rel are completely mixed together, but relatively few ways to arrange them so that the milk is segregated from the surrounding coffee. If you waited for it to happen of its own accord, as molecules randomly reshuffled, you would typically have to wait much longer than the current age of the observable universe. But even Sean Carroll, who along with Jennifer Chen of the University of Chicago proposed the symmetrical time multiverse scenario he's talking about in his article, occasionally seems to fall into the language traps that come from not completely embracing the timeless perspective. For instance, later in the article, as he describes he and Jennifer Chen's theory, he says, On ultra-large scales, such a multiverse would look statistically symmetric with respect to time. Both the past and the future would feature new universes fluctuating into life and proliferating without bound. Each of them would experience an arrow of time, but half would have an arrow that was reversed with respect to that in the others. The idea of a universe with a backward arrow of time might seem alarming. If we met someone from such a universe, would they remember the future? Happily, there is no danger of such a rendezvous. In the scenario we are describing, the only places where time seems to run backward are enormously far back in our past, long before our Big Bang. And again, that's quoting from uh, the article in Scientific American June issue by Sean Carroll. As we said in a previous blog entry about Sean Carroll's article, Time in Either Direction, it's called, and uh, again, if you search for those words on the various uh, video viewing sites, uh, that's another good video blog uh, that uh, talks about some of these ideas. The scenario he's describing is that our universe, or any other universe, is just a temporary deviation away from an underlying background equilibrium state. And I'm proposing that the background state he's referring to is very easy to align with the indeterminate tenth dimension I, I portrayed it in my visualization of the dimensions. I would propose then that Dr. Carroll saying long before our Big Bang is not really adopting the timeless perspective. It would be more correct to say that those other time reversal symmetry universe exist not before, not after, but just elsewhere within the multiverse. Once you go before the Big Bang for our universe, and once you go after the final maximum entropy state for our universe, you are backing into an underlying state where time has no meaning, because everything happens at once within that underlying fabric, which we've also come to refer to as the Omniverse. Likewise, when expert physicists like Green and Kaku talk about events which have some likelihood of occurring, but they are all so unlikely that they would take longer than the life of the universe, shouldn't the same thinking apply? Longer than the life of the universe means outside of space-time, and into the vision of timelessness 
that we're appearing into here. Saying then that a wave function event is possible but so unlikely that it occurs outside of space-time would, in my way of visualizing reality, mean that it occurs in, it occurs in the sixth-dimensional version of our reality, the parallel, parallel universes which still exist as potential for the particular different initial conditions universe we are a part of, but which are inaccessible from our current now within space-time. Okay, so while we're talking about unlikely events, let's finish this blog entry off with a song about unlikely events which exist as potential which, which we haven't witnessed yet in our own particular version of the universe. The song is called The End of the World. My name is Rob Bryanton from the Imagining the Tenth Dimension video blog. Enjoy the journey. Are predicted, never realized The end of the world Never hear it's such a surprise How could billions be so wrong? The end of the world The end of the world Has already been, it's come and gone Looking back through history we often counter prophecies of end times so very, very near. Next year, five years, ten from now, a state of flux, some way, somehow, the process of postponement never clear. The end of the world, our predicted, never realized. The end of the world, never hear it such a soon. How could millions be so wrong? The end of the world, the end of the world Has already been, it's come and gone With space and time a continuum Of everything that is to come And might have been in one infinite ball Multiple timelines now I see Apocalyptic destinies Prophets proven prophets after all The saucers already landed Our star bodies already attained Y2K, the global pandemic, huge disasters, the big freaking asteroid <laughs> destroyed the world. The end of the world, our predicted, never realized. The end of the world, never hear it's such a surprise. How could Millions be so wrong The end of the world The end of the world Has already been It's come and gone The end of the world Has come and gone